Thank you all for joining another conversation with the Marguerite Casey Foundation Book Club, Reading for a Liberated Future. My name is Dr. Carmen Rojas, and I'm the president and CEO of Marguerite Casey Foundation. Today, I'll be in conversation with author Anand Giridharadas and joined by Faz Shakir from More Perfect Union. Faz Shakir is a former national political director of the ACLU. He led the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign and is the founder of More Perfect Union. Anand Giridharadas is a former columnist for the New York Times and an author of many books, including The Persuaders, at the front lines of the fight for hearts, minds, and democracy, which we'll be talking about today. I'd love to thank our wonderful co-sponsor, Seattle Arts and Lectures. Seattle Arts and Lectures is committed to engaging and inspiring readers and writers of all generations in the greater Puget Sound region. I also want to share a little bit about Marguerite Casey Foundation. Marguerite Casey Foundation supports leaders, scholars, and initiatives focused on shifting the balance of power in society, building power for communities that continue to be excluded from shaping how society works and from sharing in its rewards and freedoms. We are so proud to be able to support authors like Anand by purchasing and sharing his work with our beloved community. Marguerite Casey Foundation is committed to providing over 2,000 free copies of his book to a mix of our registered guests and community-based organizations. And we're thrilled that those watching today will have an opportunity to learn from its critical work. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anand and Faz. Uh, Anand, I want to start with you. We normally open these conversations with the author reading a little bit from the book to help set the stage for the conversation. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I was thinking about that and I thought I would just talk about it. Uh, Great. Of, you know, read verbatim. Um, so first of all, thank you for, for having us, Carmen, and thank you, Saz, for, um, for joining in. Saz is one of the, uh, one of the, the stars of the book, and one of the people I talked to for the book, uh, and I think one of the heroes of, of thinking about persuasion in new ways in, in this time. Um, I would say the, the, the Persuaders as a book grew out of uh, a, a concern that I had that over the last several years, it became clearer and clearer that this wasn't just the normal right versus left, low taxes versus higher taxes, small government versus big government, uh, normal red versus blue contest in politics anymore. We have been entering uh, progressively a territory where it is pro-democracy versus anti-democracy, mm. uh, pro-freedom versus anti-freedom. Uh, pro everyone belonging versus anti everyone belonging, pro justice versus anti justice. The stakes, as politicians often say, but is is really acutely true now, couldn't be higher. And whether this is a liberal democracy in ten years or not, whether it's a republic in ten years or not, is literally up for grabs. And as those stakes were getting higher, I observed uh, something that gave me a lot of concern, which is that a lot of the movements that meant the worst for us, we're actually in some ways doing a better job of pulling people in and relentlessly expanding than the movements that meant the best for us. Some of the movements that actually wanted to do extraordinary things for us, wanted a bigger we, that wanted the, the, this country to live up to the founding ideals it claimed on parchment. A lot of the best movements were struggling with how to actually persuade and win over people, whether to even bother persuading and winning over people. Uh, and that was a very alarming phenomenon for me to witness. And I, so when it covers politics, who goes into these movements, who covers campaigns, who talks about them on television, watching the most exclusionary movements of our time in some ways build these kind of fake inclusive movements and watching some of the most inclusive movements of our time turning a lot of people off in a way, whether rightly or wrongly in their perception, uh, is incredibly problematic and seems to be putting us, frankly, in the direction of fascism, fascism winning. And so I became very interested in a group of people, among whom Faz is, is one, who were in some ways some of the last true believers in persuasion in a time of polarization, mm -hmm. in a time of mass writing off, in a time of assuming that the people who voted for Trump have nothing else in their story besides that. The people who don't want the vaccine are just anti-vaxxers all the way down. The people who 
uh, you know, our Christian will never come around on climate, whatever the assumptions so many of us make are. But there were these folks in movements, in working politics, in uh, education, and elsewhere uh, across the pro-democracy movement who actually still championed persuasion in, a, in an age of fractures, still believed that you actually never write people off. You may have to write off a certain number of people who are died in the world, committed ideologues for a certain fanatic cause, but that if you actually do that for everybody on the other side of politics, you're actually just kissing your own society goodbye. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the book is about a group of people, Faz and others, who refuse to give in to the notion uh, that the country is irredeemable and that everyone who currently is not for you is irredeemable. Mm -hmm. uh, and who are doing this not out of some kumbaya notion of uh, holding hands and singing, but because they want to win. They want the pro-democracy future to beat the anti-democracy vision. Uh, and I think they have a lot to teach us, the people I wrote about, uh, about how to actually build the kind of country we want. But they have a lot to teach us individually also, not just systemically, about how to win back those uncles mm -hmm. from QAnon, how to win back, uh, you know, our friends and neighbors who might believe some really awful things. But actually, if you look more closely, have the potential to come on board with us on some other things. Uh, and fundamentally, I think what everyone in the book shares, and Faz is a fantastic example of this, is a fundamental assumption about people on the other side that is, I think, different, countercultural, mm. uh, from what most of us think about people on the other side. And I, and I don't want to put words in, in Faz's mouth, but I, I think the assumption that separates the persuaders that I wrote about from the rest of us who are kind of failing at persuasion, frankly, in this age, is that they all generally think of people on the other side, a certain number of them, a large number of them, as being fundamentally torn, conflicted, susceptible to multiple different ways of looking at the world that they're not entirely, they haven't entirely resolved as yet, as opposed to died in the wool all the way down, biopsy three inches deep, convicted of their conviction. Mm. Um, and so the persuaders that I'm writing about understand what the evidence and data also show, which is that a lot of racist people voted for Barack Obama. They, they held their racism deeply and they loved Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. A lot of Republicans voted for Bernie Sanders. They think that socialism stuff is baloney. They think it's the devil's work, but they thought Bernie was fighting for them, right? A lot of people who are evangelical Christians and will vote on that issue on a bunch of things from abortion on down, don't like government mandates. And what the campaigners in Kansas did so brilliantly in recent months was harness their loathing of government mandates to get them to vote against government compelled pregnancy. Um, and so I just wanted really the bulk of the American people to learn from these, these persuaders who refuse the great American write off. Mm. and are looking for ways uh, to build a bigger we uh, and, and, and save this country from itself. Oh. Um, so many uh, follow-up questions, and I'm so excited to bring Faz into the conversation. But I want to ask you one more question, which is about Winners Take All. So for me, uh, Winners Take All was the first introduction of your writing and research and work and journalism. Um, to being able to understand the set of relationships that exist when people with concentrated wealth and power are able to uh, have conflicting commitments. On the one side of their mouth, they're talking about uh, doing well, and on the other side of their mouth, they're talking about doing well on the backs of other, they're like whispering the, a commitment to doing well on the backs of other people, right? There's like the, the thing that we say out loud and then the action that allows for the thing that we say aloud out loud. Um, do you see a relationship between the work and research that you did in Winners Take All and this book? Yeah, it's a great question. And, I, and it's um, something I've been thinking about because in some ways each book is its own, its own kind of irritation <laughs> with society turned into a book or its own itch that is scratched through research. But there's a, there's a session. So I would say, first of all, and this is my fourth book. Uh, I would say all the books actually one is about a hate crime in Texas. One is about, you know, social change in India. 
the other two that we're not even talking about. But they're all in some ways about democracy. I'm very interested in democracy. And I think I'm very interested in the kind of question of whether it can work uh, with a complex group of people in like India or Texas and, you know, where these two books. I think the journey from Winners Take All to this book is Winners Take All. We talk a lot about fake news, uh, for better or worse these days. Winners Take All was a book about fake change. Mm. It, w- it, it was a book about a certain kind of change that was being proffered by the richest, most powerful people in the society as a, in some ways, a kind of high class ruse to distract us from the real change that was sitting right over there waiting for us, which is policy, which is law, which is actually shifting the balance of power in society. And Winners Take All is about all these diversionary project to fake change, whether it's impact investing or, or, you know, philanthropic donations to like, by, you know, Goldman Sachs to, you know, reduce the racial wealth gap when, you know, or Starbucks reduce the racial wealth gap when their business activities every day are narrow, are widening the racial wealth gap, so on and so forth. It was about the notion, as you put it earlier, that you can't, uh, it, that, that there's something absurd about the kind of prevailing notion of American change and the in, in the early 21st century being that the people most responsible for our common problems should be appointed saviors and decision makers and solving the very problems they are not even done causing. Uh, the idea that Mark Zuckerberg should be shoring up election security while causing our elections to be so insecure, uh, or, you know, Sheryl Sandberg should be telling women to lean in while selling women into a kind of, uh, authoritarian misogyny, uh, whether, you know, uh, Elon Musk should be fighting climate change while not paying taxes, so on and so forth. The idea that these people, of all people, uh, you know, the worst should be the first uh, in in deciding the future of the common good is a problem. So if Winner's Take All was a, was a kind of takedown of fake change, in some ways, I think it was incumbent on me to talk about those trying to deliver real change, as I see it. And as I, in some ways, Winner's Take All put me into conversation with people like Faz and others who were delivering the kind of change that I was advocating for. And it took me into their world and seeing what they were up against. They were up against a whole different set of things. And it struck me that folks like Faz and many others, at least persuaders, um, were obviously up against the rich and powerful, as I had detailed in Winter Stake All. And that was a huge, you know, uh, problem that they had to contend with. I think one of the revelations for me after Winner's Take All was that that was not the only thing they were up against. There was a kind of second big cloud of things they were up against, which had some relationship to the rich and powerful and their obstructions. And in some ways was its own phenomenon within their spaces, within their movements, within their causes, which is a, in some ways, a tendency towards smallness, a kind of fetishization of smallness, Mm. a comfort with smallness. Uh, a, you know, and you're going to hear me use the word evangelical in non-religious context over and over again, but a kind of non-evangelical nature, uh, being totally fine with not conquering souls. And, uh, you know, when I was reporting on the Bernie campaign, Faz said a very simple sentence to me that I think became the chapter title. He said, a movement that wins is a movement that grows. You know, I think in any business context or any other normal context, that would be a very obvious statement. <laughs> you can't you can't succeed if you don't have yeah. more customers, more growth. But what, you know, frankly, Faz saying that for a very progressive candidate was a was a somewhat radical statement. That's right. And I think in some ways it was problematic that it was a radical statement. He was up against more than he should have been up against in articulating the view that there is some next ten percent for Bernie Sanders and some ten percent after that that are that are actually not the same as the first twenty five percent. And that we might actually need to say some different stuff. And then in that next 20%, or certainly in the further 20, 10%, there might be some Republicans. There might be some people with some Cold War trauma who still fear going into those nuclear bunkers who don't like the Reds. There might be some people who are put off by Bernie Sanders' personal affect. There might be any number of things. And Faz wanted every last one of those people. And as I saw it, a lot of people in these broader movements did not actually share that orientation. And I was interested in this book in understanding both how it came to be that, that it was even disputable that one would want to grow <laughs> as a movement 
And then I really spent time with folks uh, in these spaces. Alicia Garza is another example, one of the kind of leaders of Black Lives Matter. Certainly not someone who's a, you know, milk toast moderate, but someone who is an internal critic of the progressive movement and of her own spaces saying, where's the growth? Where's the evangelism? Why are we not outraged by the fact that we don't have, you know, a few percent more people in our movement every day than we did yesterday? Why is that not the only thing we're pursuing? Uh, and so that, I became very attracted to, to folks who were trying to fight that fight within their own space. Again, not because of Kumbaya, right? This can resemble, but it's fundamentally different from agree. people who want reconciliation for reconciliation's sake or comedy for com This is not that. This is about people who want to win and smash shit, frankly. But it's about people who want to show enough love in their movements and show enough openness and magnanimity in their movements to win and win big. Mm -hmm. Baz, I'd love to bring you into the conversation. I was so, so excited to um, have you be a uh, responder, a subject um, in the book, mostly because uh, I've been really proud of the foundation's ability to support more perfect union. And I think you've thought a great deal about what it takes to persuade people most recently in the support of expanding labor unions in places like Starbucks, Amazon, Trader Joe's, and Apple. What are you learning about what it takes to persuade people to engage in the struggle for economic justice? And let's take it like one step further in order to protect uh, what is left of our democracy. Oh man, a lot to say there, Carmen. First of all, I've read the whole book, The Persuaders. I congratulate on them and writing it. It's great. I'd say for all organizers out there in the world, People who want to go talk to real people and try to convert them, this is a must read and that you have to, it's a kind of a playbook of how to do things. And uh, the only thing I don't like about the book is it's raised the bar on me personally and calling me a persuader and I'll endeavor to try to live up to the term for the rest of my life. And I apologize to him if I let him down. But, <laughs> you know, in this work that I'm trying to do it, with economic justice arguments, really, if you think about labor movements in America, th there are we should step back for a second, Carmen, and talk about movements. And the, and the idea of movements is that sometimes, you know, we are oriented around a vision, and philosophy, and values that we care deeply about. And it so oftentimes by de design and by definition, you are a minority trying to convince a majority. And so you take that approach and you say, well, movements sometimes have different goals. And, and by the way in which you're trying to organize a movement, it, it could intentionally be targeted at a minority, you're trying to move a certain decision maker, a certain cl class of people, a certain number of uh, key folks. But the movements that, you know, I've been engaged in uh, that I think Anand is referring to are majoritarian movements, things that are trying to convince a lot of people. And I even win an election. You were trying to win an election, you're trying to do a majoritarian, movement, trying to convince, you know, 50 plus 1 percent of people to be with you. And when you're talking about those uh, tactics, those kinds of efforts, to my mind, that coming out of the Bernie campaign, the number one thing you have to think about um, is class, uh, class consciousness and society, the plight of working people. And that is a multi-generational, uh, uh, people with multiple racial identities, identities of all kinds, who are in that class of people, laborers in America, uh, who can constitute a vast majority of America who are ignored. And the first premise in talking about that subject is to acknowledge that people have pain and struggle in their lives and they may not always see that. And that pain and struggle doesn't have to do solely with your race, doesn't have to do solely with your identity. It's a shared pain and struggle. And when you start talking about that pain and struggle, I think that there's a way to connect it so that we are seeing each other for our commonalities more so than our differences. And that is that is really kind of in the heart of what I've been trying to do with talking about the Starbucks workers and the Amazon workers. You look at them, they come from all different kinds of backgrounds. I remember talking to Christian Smalls who successfully organized Staten Island warehouses and I got people who voted for Trump, who voted for this union. You know, and that, my hat's off to him. I think about somebody who's been able to organize a union, Staten Island warehouse, talking to people who voted for Donald Trump, but get it convincing them and persuading them appropriately that they should be with them on fighting for better working conditions, higher pay, you know, air conditioning in, in the warehouse, et cetera. He's doing that. And, and, and there's a lot to learn from all of those organizers, Starbucks organizers, Amazon workers. All of them are doing what Anand is writing about on a daily basis. They're talking to the coworkers who may not ideologically be with them politically, 
but hopefully could be with them in a democracy of the workplace. Baz, can I actually push on that a little bit more? Because one of the things that I love about the work that you do at More Perfect Union is something that I feel like we have abandoned is actually just talking about class, period. That like in progressive movement, more broadly, we're so conditioned or comfortable to talk about um, other forms of identity, be it race, be it gender. But class has been left behind as a unifying feature that will allow for a, a true struggle for a multiracial democracy. Why do you think that is, especially given your experience uh, on the Sanders campaign? What, what is our discomfort uh, as from liberals to progressives in talking about class? And why is it that uh, more conservative forces have taken on a different conversation around class to animate um, uh, greater interest or a greater ability for people to come together? How have they been able to use class as a, a persuading tool? Well, that's where Adan's other book, Winners Take All, be a great <laughs> also a primer for many people. But Carmen, the easy answer is it comes down to power. And, you know, if you're, if you're challenging power, there's a different kind of friction involved in the process. And that's what a class struggle is ultimately about. When I was Young, I was told that there were three subjects that we weren't supposed to talk about, religion, politics, and sex. Nowadays, if you're on social media, all those subjects are discussed, uh, and then some. Uh, but the class conversation that you're talking about is the one that is the most awkward and difficult, and it's awkward and difficult and challenging on essentially both ends of the class conversation. Those on the higher end who are doing well, I think if you have a consciousness, you are you know, feeling ashamed a bit about Am I doing enough? Am I thinking enough about the people who are struggling? What can I do to help? You know, do you have guilt around that? Am I doing so well? And others are not and living in this society. How can that be? How can we have a society that more people can't have nice things? Mm -hmm. uh, kid, does it have to be that way? No, it doesn't have to be that way. Why, why, does it, why is our society carved out such that only a certain number of people can enjoy nice things? That's an, by design. It's a structural law in the system. But then the, to me, the great revelation of the Bernie campaign traveling with him all over this country, when you talk to people who are on deeply struggling day to day, know every penny that is spent on their health care premiums or know every penny that they spent in disposable incomes for food, right? They know every penny. And you think and talk to them about their issues, they have shame. There's deep shame that, personal shame, that they're letting down their own family. They're letting down people around them. And that, to me, is the thing that strikes at your soul, because it, it, it isn't their shame to carry. It is the shame of a society to carry, that the, we, we have created a system that has let them down. Mm -hmm. And what that was obviously the Bernie Sanders argument was that we can, you know, and you should be in solidarity with me. You should, you should be in solidarity to fight against structural oppression. Uh, and, and let's talk about some of the ways in which it improves everyone's lives. And I, I think that if you start, if you if you have that class conversation, you're talking about taking on power. So it you, you goes circles back to this labor conversation you were just I have, you and I were just having about a Starbucks worker who's trying to organize um, a store. You know, when they're trying to organize that store, they're not merely just saying, "Hey, I want to raise the wage from eleven bucks here to about fifteen bucks." No, that's not all what they're arguing. They're arguing that. The way in which we make decisions about this store and other stores should involve us as workers because we are the labor of this place. So we should talk about how you can better treat mm -hmm. our workers and we should make help make some business decisions. And in fact, when you look at successful labor organized society like Germany, that is in fact how it works, where laborers have a seat at the table to think about the things that affect them the most. You know. And that means that you are intentionally and purposefully taking power from those who already have it, i.e. Howard Schultz or anyone who's a you know CEO, and you're saying, hey, you guys have too much. And now you have to share it with those who are helping you acquire all that much. And and I think that that obviously poses a threat that poses us. So any, anytime we're talking about, you know, Carmen, you know, t t taking on structural systemic problems, you're, you're dealing with taking on class struggle against people who already have success and you're asking them to share it with those who mm -hmm. don't and uh, it, uh, that necessarily takes it comes at some degree of cost to those who have the power and that they can uh, you know in this system that we have stop you from doing that mm. can i just can i just i, I want to add sure what faz is saying i think it's so important let me make an optimistic version of this point 
which is that actually in this country, somewhat unusually among many countries, both the race and class conversations are things we've learned relatively recently to do at any level of proficiency. And for now, mostly separately. Right? Mm. So I think we have to talk about this as novelty. Like when we were growing up, I mean, the, Bernie Sa- the reason the Bernie Sanders campaign is of cultural and historical, not just political significance, is just that notion of a kind of class-based political appeal was unheard of. It's just not how history is taught. It's not how, right? And so, you know, and there's all these essays that I say in high school, why is there no socialism in the United States? Like, and, and, and we can have a whole deeper conversation there about, I think there's this anti-royal tradition in this country going back to the founding where we were very afraid of centralized government authority, a.k.a. kings. Mm. And because in this country, we didn't have the whole Middle Ages and everything, there was less of an, a fear that you have in much more common in Europe to private power, the pri- abuse of private power. And so in most European countries, you have both the fear of the king, centralized power, and a fear of the local like lord, right? Yeah. And, and those are kind of balanced. And in America, you really have this like libertarian fear of the king, and you don't have the same fear of Goldman Sachs in the in the political bloodstream. So it, there's just a whole like it's taken a lot of work to just get Americans to be able to talk about money, class without it being called class warfare, right? So that's number one. That's a new conversation. Second, there is a pretty new ability to talk about race, right? And so and and like I mean the, the amount of the stuff that is post 2020 is also quite insane, right? That the number of using terms like white supremacy, when we were going to school, these were not terms that were used all the time. So I think we've made some progress in being able to talk about each of these things in the past several years. I think what we have not done yet is figure out how to talk about them together. There's yeah. still on the left, a lot of like, wait, is it your thing or is it my thing? Is it the class stuff, is it the race stuff? A lot of reductionism. And there's, I think some new efforts that they can we integrate in how we talk about these stories together. Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, one of the greatest examples of this is, but frankly, our first uh, book talk was with Heather McGee. Uh, and her book was the perfect example where she was able to make this uh, weave a tapestry, essentially, of connecting a, a, an experience around race and class that was meaningful and that uh, made it so visible to the reader that uh, decisions that were made to exclude specifically black people had such resounding impacts on mostly poor white people and middle class white people, not rich white people, right? And I think that we have a real, uh, um, a, like a, there's a real challenge in our movements to be able to walk and chew gum around race and class in a meaningful way, right? Like our one of our upcoming book talks is with the author of Elite Capture, which is the other side of the story, right? Which is the ways in which we have allowed a conversation of, around race to be wholly disarticulated from an ideological commitment. We assume, and we've seen, you know, through the work of people like Kianga Yamada Taylor, who profiles the ways that uh, moderate and conservative black mayors in this country have advanced more neoliberal and conservative projects and that we have a real discomfort, frankly, with being able to, to grapple with that and to do so in a way um, that I, I love this framing, this uh, phrase on and from the book that uh, Anna, that Anna uh, shares consistently, which is the ability to paint the beautiful tomorrow. Like we can't, uh, we can't grapple around this thing as well as paint a beautiful tomorrow. For some reason, that has become an impossible task for us. Um, Anand, I want to go back to you and just talk more broadly about the book. There are like a set of pretty amazing protagonists. You start to mention a couple, right? Alicia Garza, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to a cult deprogrammer. Uh, what are some of the unifying characteristics or attributes of the subjects that you profile? And are there anything, are there things about their approaches that you think uh, we should lift up as features of alignment? Yeah, I think one of the things that is probably common to a lot of my books is that I try to bring a kind of diverse group of people um, around a kind of theme or phenomenon 
but who are not identical or not all in the same world, maybe are you know, intersect in certain ways. And in some ways to show the, the commonness of what a lot of people are grappling with through disparate things. So you're right. You know, uh, there's Faz in the Bernie campaign. There's AOC. Uh, a third of the book is actually just about AOC. And I think her struggle in a modern environment to figure out how do you provoke and shift the conversation and persuade people at the same time. Uh, but there's also a chapter about white parents with adopted children of color who go to a summer camp farm in Ohio every year to learn about what they don't understand about race, that their children need them to learn to be good parents. And so that's, you know, people signing up for the kind of racial training that is inflaming debates around the country. But these are some white parents who are actually signing up, paying money to get trained. And some of them are being reborn with it and others of them are really suffering and struggling with it. Uh, and then there's, you know, Anat Shankar Osorio, who's one of the great message advisors on the left. People call him the Frank Luntz of the left, except the left doesn't listen to its Frank Luntzes. Uh, and, you know, and then there's a cult lead programmer uh, who is, you know, until now, worked on the normal scale of cult deep programmers, which is maybe one person, maybe 10 people. Uh, and Diane Benskoder is now grappling with the problem of what happens when 43 million people in this country are in QAnon, are believers in QAnon. Uh, you could argue the Republican Party itself has cult-like qualities at this point. What happens, you're talking about tens of millions of people there in a cult. Uh, and so you're right, these are very disparate examples. And I do that in part, to see, is there anything that Faz is thinking about that the cult deprogrammer is thinking about, even though they're attacking very different problems? And I would say a couple of things connect these people, although it takes different manifestations. Number one is the fundamental view of people on the other side as complex rather than simple, right? That sounds obvious, but I actually think it's very normal as a human being to know that you are complex, but to assume that the other side is very simple, right? The other side is ideological. The other side is very important. You are, you know, uh, full of teeming variety. Uh, and so whether it's the cult deep programmer who understands Yes, this person may be all the way QAnon, but no one likes to be anybody's dupe. No one likes to be anybody's fool. And so there's some part of you that I may be able to harness to bring the other part of you out. And that involves not shaming you, not making you feel stupid, any number of things, right? Now, that makes me think of I think some of the challenges Faz dealt with, which was there was a lot of people, like Bernie curious people in that outer 10% who was on the fence of the next 10% beyond that, who would like go online and say things like socialism sucks, but I think Bernie's kind of interesting. And you had this problem, I think, in the movement, if I'm not misrepresenting this, where some very already converted people would like dunk on the like anti-socialist factory worker who was starting to be Bernie Bernie Turis and saying like, like you have no understanding of theory or stuff like that. And it was just like, wait, what are you, like, what are you doing? Like making people who are, maybe thinking of coming in from the cold, like making them feel stupid is the dumbest possible thing ever. And yet it was a, I wouldn't say the dominant tendency, but it was a significant enough tendency that very important people in the movement were worried about it. Uh, and so those are the kinds of common lessons that I think span across these things. You know, in, in the racial, racial training chapter, um, I think all these educators, and this is true in classrooms across this country, no one wants to soft pedal race anymore. I think there's a, or at least no one who's actually thoughtful about this. Uh, there's a recognition. You got to say words like white supremacy. You have to, you have to name things. But I think there's a real conversation among thoughtful people about like how and when, right? Wait, like what level, like it, are these terms just to be thrown at people on day one out of some like moral virtue of like the earlier and more loudly you say it, the better? Or is there some notion of like, let me, let me pull you in here, right? Let, at that summer camp, like, let me, let me pull you into this camp with some like hair care techniques for your children that you may be wanting. And then like, let me find the way to get you to have the kinds of questions about being a white parent of children of color that create an appetite for you to want to know about structural things. And then let me get in there. Or, and I think this is an important critique, a pushback, or is soft peddling it that way is in a way letting white wariness set the rate of racial progress. Is that 
precisely what white supremacy is, right? So I think these are these are complicated debates where there is a desire to move people along, bring people in, but a real grappling in many of these movements about the proper balance of conviction and purity and standing for something mm. and out and a real concern about wanting to balance outreach with not selling out. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that this makes me think of, Anand, is a conversation. We just had a Margaret Casey Foundation board meeting, a conversation or exchange between Faz and Robin D.G. Kelly about race. And it's frankly something that I have been, the race class relationship and, and the... Um, uh, the pace at which we should be expecting people to understand and engage in ideological movements. And I'll just be, frankly, for myself, um, I, uh, I come from a family that is pretty moderate, pretty conservative. And I think the story that, like this, the story that we would love to tell about ourselves is a complete story of being raised, being born a radical, being raised a radical, staying a radical, dying a radical. And oftentimes our experience as human beings is so much messier and clumsier than that. And we don't give people the grace of being able to be in the messiness and the clumsiness. We forget the the gift of learning, frankly, the gift of books, the gift of being taught and expanding the aperture of personal experience to be able to situate oneself in systems and structures. And I think of late, one of the things back to this board meeting that I've been thinking about is frankly the place of white people in our movements, right? And I worry that one of the sort of, uh, one of the things that's being left uh, either said publicly or intimated at is that white people don't belong in the fight for a multiracial democracy. They don't belong in places of leadership. They don't belong on the front lines. They don't, their ideas and experiences actually don't matter. And I, um, I am a mass based movement person. I want to win. You know, I'm a 50 plus one person. And I'm clear that even if all the people of color got together in this country, we wouldn't have enough people to win. So like, we just like on the numbers game, we wouldn't win. And probably more important to like the feeling in my heart is that I worry that what we are not saying out loud is that when we win, we get to keep put our foot on the neck of white people the way that white people have had their foot on our neck. And that just actually isn't the world that I want. Faz, I would love uh, to bring you in. You started to share some about this uh, when you were talking about the work, uh, the organizing work happening at that Amazon warehouse. But what have you learned about cross-race, cross-class organizing? And what are the things that we get wrong that progressives and nonprofit organizations and philanthropy who, um, who identify themselves as always thinking about these things, what are the things that you think are the easy things for us, the easy fixes? I don't want to, I hesitate with starting with anything that's wrong. I, I think people, especially in our movements, have different roles to play. And in an ecosystem, we're going to have some people who are going to play the role of hammer. <laughs> and they're going to hit you over the head and say, you, Carmen, you, Anand, you, Faz, you're all living in a white supremacist structure, and you're contributing to it in the following ways. And it's intended to be a shock and awe approach, right? It's just shake you and say, oh, holy cow, I don't like hearing that. But man, maybe I needed to hear that. And that's a legitimate and valuable role to play. Mm. But where it comes into conflict is when you're trying to get into a majoritarian persuasion approach that Anna is ready, writing about. It, that, that approach may not be the persuasion one. That, that approach might be to the, you know, what you assume is, should be your converted base. It maybe isn't fully converted, but you're going to try to convert them into your converted base. As we're trying to move a lot of people from a position of just not being ideologically or philosophically aligned with us. That's where I, I, I do think that if you read Anand's book, he's, he's, he's coupling, you know, policy conversation, factual conversation with a stone, a, 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 a tone and style conversation. And, and at least when I, you know, I approach this for my own work, I say, I remind myself of the things that you're talking about, uh, Carmen, is that everyone is on a journey. I've been on my own journey raised by conservative parents. I had different views of LGBT, the LGBTQ community, 
the, on a, even abortion when I was probably under the age of 15, taught to me by a conservative religious community, taught to me by a bunch of conservatives around me. I no longer hold those. Views. I've evolved for myself as an independent thinker, moved on my own value set, but remember very much the, where I came from and, and remembering that people can and will move over time when given uh, knowledge, but given permission slips, given the power, the freedom to move, not to be morally lectured to, to told, be told that they're terrible people, right? And, and so that's the balance is to suggest that is there permission slips for people to give allowance for them to be on their journey and that you invite them, you're a welcoming movement who invites them to come over to your side. And as, and, you know, as, as you kind of engage in this tactically, I think the number one thing I keep in my head is respect. I, especially when you're talking about that race conversation, right? I, I do firmly believe there are a lot of white people out there who want to be with us and may start from a feeling of saying, I hear you, Armin, say black and brown all the time. It seems like it excludes me. It seems like my pain and struggle as a white person doesn't seem to be a part of it. And I would even say maybe that pain and struggle is not one that you even see. And so what we as a you know progressives might say is like, yes, we have white supremacy in the form of white people have held, you know, all the CEO jobs <laughs> for as long as we can remember, have held key political posts as far as we can remember. They have held power of this country. Does that mean that the white person living in Ohio and struggling with opioids? Uh, can't afford health care, is about to get kicked out of their house, can't afford the mortgage. Are they part of that problem? Right? Do they contribute? Do they make that? It, it, and, and to suggest kind of broadly that they might be, would I think be exclusionary, as you're saying, of, of inviting people in to the solidarity struggle that they need to be a part of. And so that's where I worry that when you talk in identity lens, is it, it, you're almost intentionally going to be exclusionary to those who you have not invited to this party and they need to be part of it. And if we're going to grow majoritarian, if that is your purpose, is your intention to win elections, to build broad breath efforts, to take power from people who have too much, to give power to those of us who need more, that that effort has to be broadly welcoming. Uh, and in our language, in our tone, in our style, and respect is core to it. It, it is to say, Carmen, you respect disagreement. Mm -hmm. That's core, right? You can agree to disagree. You respect somebody who comes from a different place because you're allowing them to come with you in a journey of education. I, I would also just add to that, and I think this is one of the things that I learned partly in conversation with Faz, is that there's like a basic intellectual confusion in some of these movements about like what is the highest badge of merit for movement, and I think some of these movements have taught themselves into a position where the highest badge of merit is the like average level of like totally getting it of in your movement. And in fact, I would say that's literally ass backwards. Like the measure of success of a movement is how many people in your movement who, who do not get it but are still in your movement, right? Like the measure of success is all the confused people who are still with you, mm. is all the people who, who don't know the terms, who don't know these things, who are not who ideologically don't sign your thing, but then they're still with you, right? And at some level, like, that's literally what winning is. Like, th that's how some of the most transformative forces that have won, in a, that's how they've won. It, not by changing everybody's deep and essential nature, but by, in a short-term thing of a particular contest or, or thing, getting some number of people who, you know, were, aren't on board all the way down to just like come on board for something. And I think when movements actually like shame themselves or shame those people for having like kind of flimsy adherence, they're, they're just literally getting it backwards. This is literally success. Like you, you are winning. Like you're win Like I saw it. I saw covering the Bernie campaign. I met so many like 55 year old Republican white guy factory workers in Wisconsin who were like starting to drink the brain cool, but they, to a person, were like, hate socialism, hate the fucking left, hate this, hate that, right? I like that guy though, I like that guy. 
And you can be a gatekeeper and sit there and be like, who are you? Have you read your Lenin? Or you can be like, holy shit, my word. We want to do this. And I think Faz, in some of those internal discussions, like Faz had the wisdom to be like, holy shit, we might, like, I might be living in the White House next year. Like, if that guy, like, that, that guy, that guy's when you know you're winning. That guy's not your problem. I think it's also, one of the things that I want to ask you all both, actually, is the accelerant to, uh, I'm going to reframe this question. Um, I worry that social media has played sort of an, uh, an amplifying role of uh, cannibalizing our movements. That, you know, the whole last chapter on and about direct organizing of needing to knock on a door time and again and have a conversation with somebody about a personal experience that I have had and invite them on a journey of reframing a political experience, a political decision is the hard work, right? Like that is not the work that is happening right now. And what is happening instead is this uh, extreme investment in non-durable uh, institution in favor of social media presence. And both of you have pretty significant social media presence in lives. And I wonder how you swear that. Like, what is the role of a Twitter troll? What is the role of so, I mean, you start the whole book um, with this Twitter camp, the, the camp um, of Twitter trolls. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying not to simplify the point at which uh, we are losing, but I wonder what the role of social media is in, uh, um, yeah, in cannibalizing our movements at this moment. I, I, think, I think the problem is like a lot of things, it's, it's both a really good thing and a really bad thing. And so it's easy, it's hard to, it's hard to come up with a simple you know, diagnosis or prescription for what we should do about it. There's no question that in certain ways, and we sometimes underplay this because, you know, like cafeteria lunches in school, like it's, it's like popular to dump on these social media things. I mean, they are also enormous tools of empowerment of people without traditional power. I'm not sure there's a Bernie campaign, one or two, without a whole bunch of people who are not represented well by corporate media, having like another place to say stuff. I, I just, I, maybe there would be those campaigns. Maybe there would just literally not have been those campaigns. I, I find it hard to believe that there would have been anywhere near that success without that venting opportunity and like mass, like mass connection venting opportunity that was that forum. I also think it's the case that there's, you know, uh, a pressure that some of that, those spaces put on traditional media that has held them to account and the fear of being dunked on whatever. I mean, it, it can get out of hand. But, you know, like there was a way in which, you know, Bernie, the first New York Times article on Bernie in 81 was like Burlington mayor elected with bias toward the poor, right? That was the headline. So there's a way in which like the, the opportunity for that to get dunked on by millions of people is actually a check and balance on power. That's good. You know, however, that said, I think you're right that some of the, in some ways, internal incentives for those of us who just like spend time in that kind of boat every day uh, are more towards riling up our own people than kind of small e evangelical conversion. Um, it's just not a place where that small, in part just because the dynamic is literally like people only see your things if they're already following you, right? And yes, there's retweets, whatever. But generally speaking, architecture of this thing is like a confirmation bias, like LSD trip, right? It is sort of like it's a thing designed for people who are already pre-committed to hear what you have to say, hear more of what you have to say, and tell people who they follow who are also kind of I feel like, you know, that, that this should be heard, right? So it's like plus one, plus one, plus one. Uh, so it's just not, it's not designed for persuasion. That's not, it's a problem. That's just, it's not, that's not what it is. Uh, and I think if you spend a lot of time on it, as a lot of us do, too many journalists do, too many people in politics do, it's just easy, I think, I feel this myself, to like, just like forget where most of the country is at some very epistemological level, right? Like, we all know the opinion polls are perfect some deep visceral level, I think you can get into a world where like, yeah, we're like 
five minutes away from delivering democratic socialism to this country. Or like, yes, like everybody agrees white supremacy needs to be dismantled. And like, sometimes these things are actually literally brought like 5% of people into an argument. And we kind of mistakenly imagine we've brought like 70% of people. I see this on all kinds of arguments. And so there's a way in which the kind of dunking and retweeting and venting just like make us think we've already solved the problem and make us more interested as I think uh, Michael Kinsley said a long time ago in like finding heretics and convert. And the whole goal, my book is a simple thesis. Finding heretics is not important. Finding converts is very important. And we spend a lot of time literally just doing the wrong <laughs> one of those two things. Baz? I get a lot of thoughts on that one that I agree with Anand about the, the fact that we would not have had a 100% grassroots funded campaign. I mean, it's, it, it's hard to conceive how radical that notion is before Bernie came around in 2015, 2016. 100% would be small dollar funded. And you'd have a legitimate $100 million plus presidential campaign run because of it. It doesn't happen because of, it, it wouldn't happen without social. So there, there is absolutely a case to make about how it's valuable and how we really it became a core part of our campaign and the effort to talk to people directly, you know, through social media platforms, through live streams, et cetera, when we felt like the structural um, biases of media and corporate actors, you know, would, would not allow our message to be heard otherwise. So it was, it was, it was important. And, and that gets me to the point of populism. I am a fan of populism. I am a supporter of populism. That word has kind of been demonized and derid, uh, derided because it's been associated with Trump and, and bad populism and towards authoritarian negativity, hatefulness, phobia, et cetera. That's the populism that we're generally kind of hearing about, talking about. But there's good populism. And I think Murray's campaign was a part of it, was like towards an end in which we're all in solidarity fighting for a better society than the one in which we have. It requires full participation. But when you get populism, this is the cautionary tale. The whole thing. You get populism, it's messy. And that's a story of Anand's book. Democracy itself is messy. And so what we're learning through social media is we all learn a little bit of too much about each other. That's the story of social media. You learn a little bit too much about it. So when I learn a little bit too much about, let's say, my friend Anand here, I, I see him tweet about something I don't like. What's my reaction? Oh, man, I can't believe he, my, my friend, would tweet about that terrible thing. Maybe that's how I start thinking about it. Maybe that's how I define him. And, and instead of us having had a conversation, I just thought it's sweet. Now it's pissing me off. And now he didn't even know that. Yeah, I don't, I don't like him. I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I thought he was pretty cool. Now he's not so cool. We've learned a little bit too much. And, and what happens when it learning a little bit too much is not, I don't think, a problem. It's just how, how do we react? It, it, it turn introspectively here. You know, do, do we appreciate that people are complex and different? And you don't always have to agree with them. They're going to have a different perspective on things. That's where I would like them to. But as we saw, you know, with the categorization and the hatred of, of quote unquote Bernie Bros, was that if people were rising up online and saying things they didn't disagree with, it was easy for people to say, oh, that's best. Look at, look at these heinous people out there who are saying negative and ugly things. Like, right, they're real people. I don't know. Let me introduce you to some, right? These are people who've worked in politics for a long period of time. They haven't been like schooled in the fine arts of communications. Here's some real people. This is how they talk. This is how they act. This is how they behave. How do you, as the consumer of that, react to that? How do you, you know, do, do you do you condemn and hate them because they might have a different point of view? Do you like? Can we appreciate where people are coming from and appreciate that there's different conversations? I think about the soccer fields now. You know, with my kids and the fact that most parents, when they arrived at the soccer field, now probably know a lot, a lot more than they ever did about the people who were on that field than they would have like you know, two decades ago, right? You, cause you've seen the Facebook posts of the parents and you saw so-and-so say this to so-and-so, right? Oh, did you see that they were on the flight on Twitter the other night? Or did you see that they were like taking the, on each other on Instagram? And it, 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 it leads to kind of, um, it can lead to a kind of an isolation, but my hope and, and optimism for this is that we appreciate populism for the good, that democracy is messy, that people are, you respect that people are going to come to these conversations in different ways, in different uh, from different approaches and different walks. And yes, we're seeing more of each other than we probably care to or want to, but we give allowance. For that. And we say, I don't condemn you because of what a, a tweet that I read or you said something I didn't like. So I, I'd ask that people to kind of think introspectively about it and say, am I allowing the 
consumption of what I'm seeing to alter my behavior such that I'm not giving allowance to people to be on a journey, to still be welcomed into a place. Because I, I don't think that's the place we want to live in where we allow like what you see online to then change your behavior about how you might interact with uh, real people in the real world. I want to close out with uh, a question just about you all in persuasion. So I think that often we can disassociate the practice of being able to change our mind or curiosity, like the relationship between uh, curiosity and persuasion is really close for me, that you have to be like curious and have a willingness um, to change how you think about something. Uh, I'm wondering, I'm gonna start with you, Faz, and close out with you, Anand. Um, tell us about a time that you were persuaded. Yeah, the one that keeps coming to my mind is that when I was young, uh, I was fortunate to be put in a position, uh, you know, by my former boss, John Podesta, was the head of the Center for Active Progress at the time, and he put me in charge of, you know, Think Progress, and it was a kind of publication, news publication. I was well under the age of 30. I can't say I was probably 24, 25, and here I am running kind of communications and publication for a large, you know, um, progressive think tank. And I suddenly, for the first time in my life, had to manage people. And one of the people who I ended up hiring is, you know, among many, was an older person who had kids <laughs> and uh, a life <laughs> that I had yet lived. And uh, I was hard charging when I was young. I was like, hey, we got to get the content out the door. We got to, you know, push, push, push. Uh, I was uh, bullheaded towards like, let, let, you know, fast action. Let's get things done. And sometimes I would be tough on people around uh, in the way in which I was demanding. And I remember one time this person wrote, uh, you know, the newsletters that he had just joined the team probably this weekend, and you're training these people up to about our writing style. And he submits a draft, and I remember reading the draft, and, and he was he was he was we were in an open air environment. And I yell across the room, and I'm like, "Hey, what?" Well, didn't we talk about this? Well, what's wrong? Did, what's wrong? Why didn't you? Why didn't you get this right? Didn't we talk about this yesterday? And I said it in a kind of very aggressive way that I obviously regret as I as I talk about it now even. And he said, "So I'm sorry about that. Um, no problem. I'll get you my special version." Sat down. And he texted me later in the day and said, "Hey, can we chat outside?" So sure, sure, no problem. We go outside and he goes, hey, "Listen." Everything you said was right. I, I really apologize. You know, I should have done better on that first draft. But I want to let you know that the way in which you addressed me just felt professionally disrespectful. And I think, you know, it's not becoming a like, good leader. I look up to you guys as, you know, being a good leader of the team. And that let me down. And I just wanted to let you know directly. And I, I remember feeling like I was a train, like a, a, a train with a full head of steam rolling down the track and somebody had just put up a brick wall and I slammed right into it. And I was like, holy crap. And it, it just made me stop. And I was like, shit, you're right. Why, why the hell was I, why, why the hell did I treat you right? And, and it made me stop and be like, oh, there's a different way. There's a better way in which I could have spoken with you and communicated with you and successfully still have achieved this outcome. And I, I remember just being one of the first moments of being a young manager where I needed someone who had enough comfort in their own skin, older, older, kind of like be willing to come to me and give me that feedback in a way that I could receive it too. Because he could have easily just stood right up and said, what the hell are you talking about? How you dare you address me in front of everybody else like that? What are you doing? And, and he did it. And the way in which he addressed me back converted me, persuaded me, and made me reflect. And it came from a place, quite frankly, of empathy, of like, I want you to succeed now, but the way you did it hurt me. And I'm asking you to change. And I was like, that I remember that conversation. I've told that conversation, conversation a number of times. It just changed me as a manager. And I've tried to hold it ever since. Um, yeah. so that's Thanks, Faz. Uh, Anand, can you close us out? Yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, I'm a reporter by training. And I think reporting, the experience of actually reporting uh, has often been... Uh, been persuasive in the sense that I thought a certain thing, I had a certain intellectual background and, and the experience of reporting and interviewing and talking to people uh, or 
looking at data, whatever, whatever the reporting, this stuff uh, is kind of is persuasive out of a certain existing frame. And the, the most, you know, perhaps fundamental for me as a writer example of that was uh, growing up in this country uh, as a child of, of uh, Indian immigrants with a narrative, a kind of often uh, commonplace uh, Im immigrant slash American dream narrative around, you know, success and opportunity and work hard, play by the rules and uh, pursue your dreams, anything possible in America. My parents were fortunate enough that that felt like a true story. And it was sort of our family culture and it was sort of the narrative. And then when I was, uh, when I was in, college, I, in a year, I decided to move to India and I became a reporter uh, when I was 23 for the New York Times, foreign correspondent. And I started covering India, the country my parents had left. And there's something about the dramatic nature of, of inequality in India that made me realize in the Indian context, people don't make their own destiny. You know, as much as that was my mental model, India just dramatizes that to a degree that's unignorable at my work as a reporter. And then that kind of made me realize, like, actually, people don't make their own destiny anywhere, <laughs> you know? But seeing it in India as a reporter helped me understand a kind of truth that really was the opposite of a kind of American, like, anyone can do it if they try narrative. And then I came back home to America as a reporter and, you know, and, and, and spent a lot of time reporting on the fact that what's true in India is kind of true here, just more subtle. And covered up with kind of more lexuses and driveways, but still kind of still fundamentally the reality. And so I think a lot of the work that I've ended up doing, writing about these divides in America and elsewhere, came from being disabused of my own, you know, like childhood and family narratives around immigrant can do and success and uh, and and understanding that, you know, in in most of the societies we come from, if you're lucky enough uh, to be in a good places because you're the exception, not the rule, mm -hmm. and that one's attention should be focused on rules, not exceptions. Mm -hmm. And I've in some ways ever since uh, that, I think, radicalizing, awakening experience and I've devoted myself to writing about, you know, those rules and not being a chronicler of exceptions. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, to both of you, uh, Anand and Faz, uh, I am so grateful to have had this opportunity to talk with you both today. I uh, continue to learn so much for, from both your work and writing. And thank you to everyone who was able to join us today.